It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, uh, good morning, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, it's now been a year since the government announced they would open up the Green Belt for sprawling development. Thanks to the hard work of journalists and citizens and the official opposition NDP, along with bombshell reports from the Auditor General and the Integrity Commissioner, we know that this scheme set up a few well-connected land speculators for an $8 billion payday. This corruption scandal has gotten so big, Speaker, that the RCMP is on the case, interviewing key figures in this government. Speaker, will the Premier finally tell all Ontarians the full extent of his involvement in the Greenbelt scandal, or do we have to wait for the RCMP to finish their criminal investigation? I'm going to uh, caution the Leader of the Opposition on uh, some of the language that she's using. Um, I'll allow the Minister of Municipal Affairs housing to reply. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the uh, Leader of the Opposition uh, knows uh, full well, of course, uh, this government has been focused on building homes uh, since uh, day one. The Premier has been very, very clear on that. Uh, since 2018, we've brought in housing supply action plans each and every year of, uh, of our mandate. Uh, and because of those, uh, those positive uh, bills, we have seen uh, housing starts uh, increase to, at, to their highest levels in over 15 years, and that includes purpose-built uh, rentals. Now, with respect to the Greenbelt, we have also been uh, uh, clear that uh, we made a public policy decision that was focused on building more homes faster. It was not supported. Uh, the policy decision was obviously not supported by the people of the province of Ontario. That is why there is a bill before this House uh, uh, to restore those lands to the Greenbelt, but to go even further, to provide uh, 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 an additional layer of protection on the lands, layers of protection that have never been, uh, uh, been the case ever before. So we're quite proud of that, Speaker, but at the same time, we will Response. double down and make sure that we build those 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario. A supplementary question. Speaker, three cabinet ministers have resigned or run for the exit. From stag and does to Vegas vacations to secret USB keys, there are still so many unanswered questions. Ontarians deserve answers. Staff in the Conservatives' inner circles are leaving under a cloud of suspicion, and they're lawyering up, Speaker. The Premier has said the buck stops with him, so let's hear from him. Will the Premier finally come clean and explain his personal involvement in the Greenbelt scandal? Take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I think uh, both the Integrity Commissioner's report and the Auditor General's report were uh, uh, clear on the, on the Premier's uh, uh, involvement or lack thereof, uh, frankly. Having said that, uh, Speaker, we are very uh, focused on building 1.5 million homes to eliminating the obstacles that have been put in the way by the previous Liberal and NDP coalition in this province that saw housing starts uh, fall to their lowest uh, in, uh, in years, Mr. Speaker. Coupled on top of that, Speaker, the policies uh, supported by the Liberals and NDP, uh, with high debt, uh, high taxes, uh, uh, red tape, uh, out-of-control spending have led to uh, an inflation crisis in the, in, uh, across Canada, which have led to the most rapid increase in interest rates that we have ever seen in this, uh, in this country. So we are also fighting back on that, Speaker. But having said all of that, I am very encouraged. We're Once. still seeing housing starts remain very, very strong, so the people of the province of Ontario can still share in that dream of getting out of their parents' basements, where the NDP would like to keep them, and having the dream of home ownership being theirs. The final supplementary. Speaker, not even at the height of the Liberals' gas plant scandal has a government been in such disarray. The government said they were going Order. to clean things up. That's what this premier Order. ran on, and now he's embroiled. Order. Order. I have to be able to hear the Leader of the Opposition, who has the floor. Dooley has the floor. Don't heckle the chair. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. 
Thank you, Speaker. I understand why this, they're uncomfortable with this line of questioning, because they're under RCMP criminal investigation. The government said they were going to clean things up. That's what the Premier said when he ran, and now he's embroiled in a scandal that has seen ethics laws broken. Both the current and former Ministers of Housing confirmed that interviews with the RCMP were ongoing. My question is for the Premier. How many current or former Cabinet Ministers or political staff have been questioned by the RCMP? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I don't know what the Leader of the Opposition is talking about. I mean, the only party in this place that is, is in disarray really is the Leader of the Opposition's party, Speaker. You have members in that caucus who refuse to take their seats when she is in her seat, Mr. Speaker, and when they come into this place, the Leader of the Opposition leaves the room. That is where the NDP is right now, Speaker. You have unions that traditionally Order. Unions that traditionally supported the NDP disavowing themselves of the support that they once had for that party. I am told that this weekend the NDP Order. Council will debate a motion of censure against their own leader, Mr. Speaker. So when it comes to being in disarray, I think the Leader of the Opposition has a lot to answer for. What we are doing is this. We are building a strong on Ontario. We have cut taxes, eliminated Pots. red tape. We have brought bills before this House to improve home care and long-term care. We are building roads, bridges, hospitals, employments at its highest level. I think we're doing great. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Supplementary question. Speaker, touchy. Touchy, aren't they? RCMP criminal investigation underway of this government. Speaker, this government talks a good game when it comes to workers, but their actions tell a really different story. Ontario's nurses fought hard to secure wage increases above the limits imposed by this government's Bill 124, that unconstitutional bill. And since then, other deserving public sector workers have won back some of the wages that this government tried to suppress. They had to take this government to court to do it, though. My question is to the Premier. Will the Premier finally repeal his unconstitutional Bill 124? To reply, the President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I'm incredibly grateful for the tremendous contributions of Ontario's public se sector workers. And I appreciate the opportunity given to me by the Leader of the Opposition to highlight some of the significant investments our government has made and is continuing to make in high-quality services that Ontarians deserve. So when it comes to health care, Mr. Speaker, we're making record investments in the system that was neglected by the previous government and propped up by the, by the NDP. Our investments have built 3,500 hospital beds across the province. We've launched the largest medical school expansion in this province's history. We've registered 63,000 new nurses, and we've reduced the surgical backlog to pre-pandemic levels. Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to get shovels in the ground and 50 new hospital developments Order. across the province, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, these are things, these are critical projects that the NDP and the Liberals have voted against consistently. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to deliver for Ontarians. Final supplementary. Let me tell you, this, this government did manage to unite Labour around one of its policies when they tried to use the notwithstanding clause against education workers. This minister knows all about the notwithstanding clause. But those workers, those workers, they stood up to this government, right. and so did we. The Conservatives showed they would rather take away their rights than treat them with respect, and the Premier had to back down from that one. So to the Premier again, has the Premier finally realized he can't push around working people in this province, or is he going to try it again? The Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, uh, talking about uh, our relationship with unions, I'm very proud to confirm that this government got a deal with the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, <laughs> delivering stability for 950,000 children. In the the Minister of Education is about 10 feet away from me. I can't hear him. So I had to interrupt him. He still has a few seconds on the clock. We can start the clock. The Minister of Education can reply. Thank you, Speaker. So, yes, we can get deals with our education partners. We're proud to have delivered stability with EDFO and likewise with QP and likewise with OSSTF. And we're urging OECTA 
We're urging AFO, the Catholic and French Board, the Catholic and French unions, to get this negotiation done. If the opposition member wants to lecture us on relations with the unions, use your power to urge your friends in Labour to get this deal done to provide stability for Ontario families. The member for Waterloo will come to order. The final supplementary. The government can say whatever they want, but for thousands of working people in the province, it has been a very long year asserting their rights for a fair contract. Right. Metro grocery store workers, library workers, electrical safety workers, TVO staff, actor commercial performers, public health nurses, and the list goes on. This week in Ottawa, they're debating Bill C-58. It would prevent replacement workers, let's call them scabs, from being brought in and prolonging labor disputes. The Premier's friend, Mr. Paul Yavra, and his Conservatives have been completely silent on this. So will the Premier stay silent as well, or will he support the NDP's bill to ban replacement workers once and for all in the province of Ontario? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Order. Order. Thank you, Speaker. No, we won't be supporting that piece of legislation. Speaker, when the opposition held the balance of power and had the opportunity to introduce this over 15 years, they didn't. But what this government's done is we've created unparalleled economic opportunity. And you know who wins when we create that economic opportunity? Unions, yeah. labour, unionized jobs. We've created the conditions for incredible economic growth that's seen Unifor workers on the jobs. They recognize, labor unions recognize that when our economy succeeds, they succeed. We've been investing in training, in skills development that's lifting people up yeah. and supporting unions in the process. That's why in the last election we were endorsed by eight of them. I know members opposite are really struggling. They're caught between the woke ideologies of folks in downtown Toronto yep. and their labour roots, and they're being Order. pulled apart at the seams. That's why that leader uh, ran unopposed in the last Spons. leadership. Spons. Speaker, we're going to stay focused on working with labour unions, supporting labour, creating unparalleled economic growth so that unionized succeed. Thank you very much. Order. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. I guess the minister forgot that the Conservative government voted against anti-scab legislation when I was a worker standing over here while scabs were crossing That's my picket right. line. That's right. In the gallery, Speaker, we have members from ACTRA representing 6,000 of their members who have been locked out for 18 months while wealthy ad agencies are demanding wage cuts and an end to benefits and retirement contributions. And then because Ontario doesn't have anti-scab uh, legislation, Speaker, they locked them out and they hired scab labour to do the work. And instead of standing with these workers, Speaker, the Conservative government keeps buying ads from union-busting ad agencies. Oh, wow. Speaker, for 18 months, the Premier has turned his back on these workers. For 18 months, the Premier has been proud to use ad agencies using scab workers and government-funded ads. Shameful. My question, Speaker, will the Conservative government finally stand with these 6,000 workers instead of wealthy union-busting corporations and pass the NDP's anti-scab legislation? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it's always one, nice to see once every quarter that member stand up and pop and ask up a question on stuff when he he has the opportunity to stand up and support the two Order. the two capital SDF projects in his riding that unions have brought forward to my ministry. I'm working with them to expand opportunity for unions. Every time he's had an opportunity, he's voted against them. He's voted against mines. He's voted Order. against the unionized workers to support our auto industry. That member is a crony when it comes to every opportunity for unionized Order. workers to bring opportunity in the auto sector, to bring opportunity in creating the critical minerals we need to support those unionized auto jobs. He's been asleep at the switch. Folks in Sudbury know that my office door is always open to support those capital projects for unionized workers. We're going to keep creating Response. those opportunities. And when he stands up another quarter from now, hopefully, Speaker, we will have approved some of those projects to get those union workers. Stop the clock. I'm now going to caution the Minister of Labour on the use of his language. It's causing some consternation in the House. Start the clock. The next question, the member for 
Supplementary question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario used to have anti-scab legislation that was brought in by an NDP government. However, the Harris Conservatives got rid of that straight away, and ever since, workers and those who respect them have been fighting to reintroduce protections against the use of replacement workers. This minister is a big talker, but I wonder if this new Minister of Labour would walk a strike line and hear how ugly working conditions can be and maybe understand how scab labour leads to higher conflict picket lines, jeopardizes workplace safety, undermines the bargaining power of workers, and drags out strikes. I am proud to have co-sponsored Bill 90, which is the 16th time that the NDP has brought anti-scab legislation to this House. I hope the government will pass Bill 90 today. So my question is this, why won't this minister and government support workers and support anti-scab legislation? Minister of Labour. Speaker, uh, that member's right. I am a talker, as are all politicians in this House, to be fair, Speaker. And you know who I'm talking to, Speaker? I'm talking to the incredible unionized workers. Last night I was talking with Carpenters Union, Leuna. I was talking to iron workers. I was talking with boiler makers last night. All of them recognize that under this government, we've brought in the largest skills development fund in Canadian history, Speaker. It's helping lift people up. Speaker, I'm hearing stories of refugees, asylum seekers given opportunities to work in union training centres. I'm hearing contractors who are working hand-in-hand -hand with unionized workforce to create opportunities in this great province that is Ontario. Speaker, Perhaps that member should walk around and talk to the auto workers who, thanks to the leadership of this Premier and this Minister of Economic Development, have tons of jobs in Response. creating the electric vehicles, the batteries and the EV automotive jobs of the future being done by workers here in Ontario, thanks to the leadership of this Premier. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Uh, the Governor of the Bank of Canada now says that the correct impact of the carbon tax on the inflation rate is actually four times higher and far more significant than his previous estimates. So, In my conversations with constituents, they tell me about the unnecessary harm that the carbon tax is creating. And they have asked me to continue raising their concerns about the negative impact of the federal government's regressive tax. Across this province, many households are struggling to make ends meet, and businesses continue to face economic uncertainty due to the ongoing global supply chain challenges. Speaker, can the minister please explain the impact of the carbon tax on the people of Ontario? Minister Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. The member is absolutely right, and we know that now is not the time for punitive and costly taxes that make life more affordable for the people here and across the country. But, Speaker, it's unfortunately not just the federal Liberals that are supporting a carbon tax. Just this week, the majority of Liberal members chose to once again vote against our motion on the removal of the carbon tax on all home heating fuels. Mr. Speaker, somehow everyone but the Liberal Party seems to know that this carbon tax is hurting the pocketbook of Ontario families and making their lives more unaffordable. The Bank of Canada has said it drives up inflation. The parliamentary budget officer shows that it results in income loss for average Canadians. Our constituents tell us every day, Response. Mr. Speaker, how it makes things more expensive. And Mr. Speaker, it's time for all parties to join together in agreement that this carbon tax Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Member for Brantford Brant will come to order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the minister for his cogent work in his portfolio. The prime minister needs to step up and do the right thing and eliminate the carbon tax because Ontarians are suffering. And as the finance minister so eloquently put it. Everyone everywhere is fully aware that the carbon tax is hurting our economy and driving up prices. So, Speaker, we know that the carbon tax is not only affecting the price of energy and gas, but also the price of food and housing and so much more. Uh, the people of Ontario are looking for financial relief, but the reality is that the federal government is not willing to do the act. And neither are all the members of this House. Uh, Speaker, 
Can the minister please advise Order. how our government is providing support to the people of Ontario during this economically challenging time? Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Thornhill for that great question. Just last week, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal member from Canada, Carlton, said that the vast majority of Ontario households are better off with a carbon price. This is despite all the evidence to the contrary, and welcome to the House. But the member asked where this government stands on the issue of affordability, and I am happy to highlight real actions from our government for the people. Mr. Speaker, for those who commute, we're eliminating double fares in the GTA for up to $1,600 a year. And Mr. Speaker, we've extended the gas tax cut for Ontario drivers from December to June 2024. Mr. Speaker, this will continue the savings for the average driver of $260 in their pockets. Mr. Speaker, we will not stop the work to fight the carbon Spons. tax and make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. The next question. The member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We learned that former Conservative MPP and lobbyist for the local developers, Bart Mays, was quietly removed as vice chair from the Niagara Parks Commission by the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, with two years left on his term. Mays was also removed from the Niagara Bridge Commission. The move to strip Mays of his appointments to both the commissions was done with no notice or explanation. This week, when questioned by the media, the minister refused to explain why the government would remove one of their political allies. My question is simple. Why was Mays removed from the Niagara Parks, the Niagara Falls Briggs Commission by this government? Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd, I'd like to thank the member opposite for the question. I see a little bit of tone in his voice. I, maybe it's because the Argonauts didn't make it to the Great Cup this year, but there's another year, okay, at, at, at some point. The Ministry of Tourism and Culture and Sport supports 16 agencies and attractions across Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and changes, and, and, and let me not forget maybe the most important thing. They are huge drivers and supporters of tourism for this province that drives billions of dollars not only to that marketplace but around Ontario. So we've got to make sure we, we don't forget that. Changes to the members and leadership of Ontario's agencies and boards are a common occurrence. And when it happens, we typically don't take out billboards or run ads when it happens. Uh, Mr. Maves has done a lot of great work, and we appreciate the time he had spent with us. Thank you. Supplementary question. I appreciate the response, but we're not talking about a commissioner that just left the Parks Commission because something came up. We're talking about a commissioner that is a vice chair of the commission and was taken off. The Niagara Parks, this is back to the Premier, sorry, Speaker. The Niagara Parks Commission is a key part of our tourist industry in Niagara, mm -hmm. and it supports 40,000 jobs. They generate tens of millions of dollars each year in revenue and have an operating budget of nearly $120 million, equal to the City of Niagara Falls, supporting over 1,700 jobs in our community, while also preserving the natural and cultural heritage of the Niagara River. In Niagara, we expect the parks to run for free from political interference. Right. Yet this government has been st stacking the Niagara Parks Commission with failed PC politicians and friends. So it's odd that you would suddenly Question. remove a government house leader will come to order. Minister, Minister, Minister of Education will come to order. Member for Niagara Falls will conclude his question. In Niagara, we expect the parks to run free from political interference. Yet this government has been stacking the Niagara Parks Commission with failed PC politicians and friends. So it's odd. It's odd you would suddenly remove a longtime PC Question. insider like Mr. Mays. Premier, is there more to this story? Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, it, it's interesting uh, that the member was opposite was talking about how great what goes on in Niagara Parks and the people that participate and sit on the board for the past years and will continue to do, and the great work that they do. And at the same time, He's asking the question why. Well, there have been changes, Mr. Speaker. Boards get changed all the time. 
things happen. Yeah. And there's no reason and opposition come to order. And there is absolutely no reason for us to send her anybody out at any time, Mr. Speaker. They commit their time order. and their efforts to make things better. The member identified how great it's been there, and it will continue to get even better, Mr. Speaker, because of the people that take their time out of their daily lives and their jobs to sit on boards to support the agencies and drive tourism in Niagara Parks and the Niagara region. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. Speaker, residents in Northern Ontario and Indigenous communities are being negatively impacted by the carbon tax. The rising costs associated with the carbon tax, particularly in transportation and supply chain activities, are posing challenges for individuals, families and businesses. Given the current reality of higher expenses for transporting goods in Northern Ontario, the carbon tax only serves to make the situation worse. As a result, people are experiencing increased financial burdens at the gas pumps and in grocery stores. There are unique circumstances in the North that must be considered, particularly when it comes to travel. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax is negatively affecting Northern and Indigenous communities? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, in 2015, when I was Canada's Minister of Natural Resources, we gave Canadians fair warning that this carbon tax was going to be the single biggest reason for increase in the cost of goods and services this country had ever seen. It's come to fruition, Mr. Speaker. On a collision course with inflationary times, out in northwestern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, I can't help but say with our friends from the District Services Board and school boards here today that it costs more to fuel buses. It costs more to send kids from one school to another school some 215 kilometres away for a football game or a basketball game, Mr. Speaker. When those ambulances go out much farther distances than other regions in this province, Mr. Speaker, it costs more money. With gas at $1.70 a litre right now in Dryden and Kenora, Mr. Speaker, and the deep freeze setting in of winter, Response. I can't help but think that we're going to be bearing more and more costs as the carbon tax goes up and up. Mr. Speaker, this ludicrous tax needs to go. Let's scrap the tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that response. It's deeply concerning that the federal government is enforcing this burdensome tax that continues to negatively impact individuals and families in northern and indigenous communities. The carbon tax is increasing, increasing expenses that are part of our everyday lives groceries, fuel, and home heating. These added costs are making life more unaffordable for many households. Speaker, it is disheartening that instead of providing support to Northern Ontario, the previous Liberal government, with the backing at the time from the NDP, chose to label the North as a no-man's land. Northern Ontario faces distinct challenges, especially when it comes to the cost of fuel. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how this regressive carbon tax is impacting Northern Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's true that Indigenous communities in the far north are feeling the impact like no other region in this country from the carbon tax. For years, Indigenous leadership has been calling for the removal of the carbon tax. Abram Benedict, the Grand Chief of Akwesasne First Nation, had been advocating for an exemption to the carbon tax for, tax for all Ontario Indigenous reserves through the Chiefs of Ontario. And he was right. Wonder Bread is $6.49 today in Sachigo Lake First Nation. Most gasoline is over $3 a litre. I was encouraged to see the member of Kiwaitanung recognize just this past week that costs are indeed higher for carbon tax and people in the isolated communities need relief, Mr. Speaker. The problem is it's fallen on deaf ears. The federal government has no plans to, re uh, to eliminate the carbon tax on the costs of fuels to, e to energize our communities up north or the costs of goods, Mr. Speaker. It's a ludicrous tax. It needs to go. Let's scrap the tax. Next question. The member for Kiwetanong. Uh, good morning, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. 
Uh, speaker, uh, there isn't always uh, public transparency about the evidence used by this government um, to make their decisions. The Chiefs of Ontario have asked this government to meet with them as they have concerns about Métis consultation with no answer. When will this government sit down with them and discuss Ontario's identification of Métis communities? Mr. Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every quarter, we have met with the Chiefs of Ontario and the Indigenous Leadership Council. We develop a, a joint agenda. Most of it is actually driven by the Chiefs of Ontario and ministerial colleagues and parliamentary assistants join in those meetings, Mr. Speaker. There are myriad other uh, meetings that are held in between those times, Mr. Speaker, but I can assure the member uh, that those meet meetings are regular. They include the Premier from time to time, and we're very proud of the relationship that we have with the Chiefs of Ontario. It is, tr it is transparent, it is substantive, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue those meetings every quarter uh, as we go along. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Um, Speaker, uh, members of the Waban Tribal Council are here. They also have uh, raised concerns about Métis recognition in their territory. Decisions made by Ontario that create recognition will have current and future impacts on legitimate rights holders for many generations. Uh, speaker, uh, can uh, this government speak on how Ontario concluded that there is a distinct Métis community in the Abitibi inland on First Nations territory? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, Mr. Speaker, what the member and I can agree on is the fact that the federal government has introduced legislation that is problematic be as between Métis uh, communities and First Nations communities across uh, this country, and that furthermore, uh, it lacked the kinds of consultations with provincial territorial governments, First Nations governments, and uh, quite possibly Métis governments, Mr. Speaker. We don't have a record of those consultations. We just know uh, that we weren't, uh, uh, we weren't addressed with regards to it. That said, Mr. Speaker, it is not our style of this Premier or our government, Mr. Speaker, to be divisive. We understand the balance that we have to strike between the, the Métis communities and the First Nations communities, and we encourage the leadership of the Métis Nation of Ontario and the Chiefs of Ontario Response. to get in the room together, Mr. Speaker, to have a discussion, look for solutions and opportunities in this important debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. This government has a habit of admitting mistakes only when they get caught red-handed. The $8.3 billion Greenbelt giveaway, by the, uh, well documented by the Auditor General, the Integrity Commissioner, and now under criminal investigation by the RCMP, is only their latest scandal. They also have a habit of blaming problems in our province that they govern on every level of government except their own. We have an affordability crisis, and yet what does this government do in their fall economic statement? They create a new bank with $3 billion of taxpayer money. Speaker, 2,023 days ago, on May 10, 2018, the government made a promise, one that remains broken to this day. They promised to lower taxes for lower- and middle-income households. That would put up to $1,691 back question. into those households' bank accounts. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier, when will the government stop playing the blame game and finally keep their promise to lower taxes and help Ontario families? To reply, the Premier. I'll just, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll touch on the green belt for, for a second, the double, double standard here. You change it 17 times, but no one said anything because you were taking care of the environmentalists. That, that's one thing. Talk about raising taxes, Mr. Speaker. Ta talking about raising taxes, our government has never raised a tax on the backs of the people of Ontario. We've never raised a tax on the backs of businesses. To the contrary, 
We lowered taxes to a tune of $8 billion to attract the companies that they chased out of our province. Exactly. They chased out 300,000 jobs as we created the environment for, for 715,000 jobs. We're putting money back into people's pockets. As you increased taxes by billions and, and billions of dollars and made this the worst job. Okay. Member for Ottawa South must come to order. Start the clock. The Premier. Boy, I was on a roll there, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Any, anyways, Mr. Speaker, we inherited a mess. The province is going in the right place. We hear it not just from everywhere around Canada, around North America, but the entire world. We're the hottest place in the world to invest in, no matter if it's life sciences, technology, or EV batteries. The supplementary question, back to the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. Well, there you have it. The Premier proves my point. It's everyone's fault but their own. <laughs> it's unfortunate, but no surprise, that again today, this government extends its broken promise to lower taxes for middle-income households by 20 per cent. They broke their Greenbelt promise, too, and we know where that has left, led them. Speaker, families earning between $46,000 to $92,000 could save up to $1,691 if this government were to simply keep its promise. That's money that could help those families deal now Order. with high rents and the cost of living. Speaker, this government and this government alone has Order. the power to keep its promise. But instead of doing so, it's going to spend $3 billion to set up an infrastructure bank that will only attract the money the government says it will if the government privatizes our public services. So once Question. again, to the Premier, will the Premier keep his promise and make life more affordable for Ontario families by lowering taxes now? Minister of Finance can reply. Mr. Speaker. Oh, I love these questions, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Well, you know what? We got into power in 2018. Who, let, who gave us an infrastructure deficit? Was it this side? No, it was that side. It was that member's party. Mr. Speaker, we hadn't built subways, no hospitals, no roads, no bridges, no long-term care. And Mr. Speaker, when we lowered the gas tax, did that member vote yes or no? No. When we lowered the individual family tax credit, so that we pay some of the lowest taxes for low-income workers? Did she vote yes or no? No. When we vote, we, we <laughs> voted to build the 413 and the Bradford bypass. Did they, she vote yes or no? No. Mr. Speaker, I think I've made the case. We're the party of yes, they're the party of no. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Good morning, Speaker. Thank you. My question is to our Solicitor General. It's no secret that people from across Ontario are fed up with the unnecessary and useless carbon tax. Totally. It's regressive and punitive. It hurts everyone, and it makes life more expensive for hardworking families, businesses throughout the province. But the carbon tax is not only increasing costs of goods, it's driving up costs of fuel and gasoline for all of us. We've heard about the, the negative impacts of carbon tax and the rising costs for families and businesses, but our frontline paramedics, police, and firefighters are also impacted. Speaker, can our Solicitor General please explain the negative impacts of the carbon tax on law enforcement and public safety agencies across Ontario? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend from Chatham, Kent Leamington, and he's absolutely right for asking the question. Who would believe that when you think of public safety, it costs more because of the carbon tax? F police officers, firefighters, special constables, all the first responders that drive cars to keep our place safe have to pay the carbon tax in every gasoline, in gasoline fill-up they make. The carbon tax has made a crucial operation that keeps our community safe so expensive. And Mr. Speaker, we're talking about thousands of automobiles. We're talking about 4,000 automobiles alone at the OPP. This is millions of dollars Order. of wasted money that could be used to keep our 
province safe. So, Mr. Speaker, it's enough. Thoughts? Is enough. We're calling on the federal government do the right thing and get rid of the tax. Member for Hamilton Mountain, to come to order. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to our Solicitor General for that response. The carbon tax negatively impacts our frontline police, firefighter, paramedic, and correction services by placing an unnecessary and significant burden on them. This tax impacts the very institutions that keep our communities safe. The federal government's carbon tax is draining resources that should be better spent on protecting our families, supporting victims of crime, and holding criminals accountable for their actions. It's vital that we provide our police services with support and resources they need to protect our communities instead of paying additional fuel costs because of this carbon tax. Speaker, can our Solicitor General please elaborate on how funds spent on the carbon tax could be better allocated to keeping Ontario safe? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This time of the year, many police services all across Ontario are fixing their budgets. And it is so obvious that one of the line in the budget is the Order. fuel needed to pay for the gas that runs the cars. In each gallon of gas, in each litre of gas, there is carbon tax, and it's millions of dollars of wasted money. Our communities have a right to be safe. We have a right to be safe in our own homes and communities, and the carbon tax is adding to every municipal police service budget and the OPP. So I'd like to say to the members opposite, from places like Sudbury and Ottawa and Hamilton, ask your police chiefs if they have to pay the carbon tax and tell your federal friends in Ottawa, get rid of it. Stop the clock. Um, a fairly substantial number of members have repeatedly ignored my efforts to get them to come to order. So the next time you'll be warned. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Children societies in northeastern Ontario are in crisis due to the lack of resources. Sudbury and Manitoulin CAS is running a deficit despite not being allowed to do so because their budget has been cut by half a million dollars a year. The minister wouldn't make himself available when asked to comment on this by the media. So what will he say about this situation now that he's here in the House? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I thank the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, I want to make it very clear. We want every child and youth in this province to have a safe, loving, stable here, home, here. regardless of their circumstances. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, the member has probably not paid attention, but I've been traveling the province, meeting with families and service providers, and, and she knows, she's aware of it because they're telling her. I know that they're telling her. Mr. Speaker, we backed up the work by over $1.5 billion of investment, Mr. Speaker. We have hired more inspectors on the ground to inspect the facilities. Those inspectors, Mr. Speaker, are going in unannounced as well. So there's not only more inspectors, there are more unannounced inspections that are being done. Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure that every youth, every child in this province is protected and supported so that they can continue to Spons. succeed and thrive in their communities. Mr. Speaker, it's a commitment we will never waver from. Yeah. Supplementary question, the member for Hamilton Speaker, you know what the Children's Aid Societies are telling me across this province? That this minister does not listen to their funding needs and go. that the cuts are hurting them. That's what they tell me. My office hears from the local children's aid service providers uh, who are struggling to provide services for children in care because their budgets have been cut to the bone. Sudbury and Manitoulin CAS have no new foster families to place children in when they're in desperate need. The head of the Nipissing and Perry Sound uh, CAS said the following. Quote, if we had to remove a child or children from a home, we have nowhere to put them. End quote. Speaker, 
What possible explanation does the minister have for his severe cunning futs to the Children's Aid Societies, and what's his next plan when a child's in crisis? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, I know that the member perhaps may be struggling with numbers, but as I mentioned earlier in the first answer, Mr. Speaker, we are investing oh, over. The member for Hamilton Mountain is warned. The member for Sault Ste. Marie is warned. Minister has the floor. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services is receiving more than $2.3 billion of support thanks to this Premier, thanks to this Minister of Finance, so that we can continue to provide those energy important supports, Mr. Speaker. That investment of $1.5 billion that I mentioned earlier, it's important to note where it's going. Mr. Speaker, for the first time in the history of the province, we are making sure that children and youth succeed and thrive, not only now, but in the future. That's why we started Fonts? that support at the age of 13, Mr. Wow. Speaker. That's we continued right. that support with financial supports up to the age of 23, so that the, ch the children and youth that age out of care can have employment. Thank you. The next question. Next question, the member for Carleton. Hey, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. The federal government released its fall economic statement on Tuesday. Not surprisingly, my constituents in Carleton have already told me that they are very disappointed that the federal government has refused to address affordability for Ontarians. The federal government is continuing to apply a disastrous carbon tax on everything. Speaker, it is even more disappointing that the independent Liberals in this House continue to support the federal government's actions. And what's more, Speaker, as we approach winter and as the weather becomes colder, the federal government could have removed the HSD charge from home heating expenses, but sadly, they did not. Speaker. Can the minister please share his views about the impact of the fall economic statement on all Ontarians? Thank you. <laughs> minister of Energy. Thank you, the uh, member for Carleton, for the great question this morning. It appears that uh, our pleas to the federal government have gone uh, unanswered and unheard. I can tell you a recent Angus Reid poll shows that only 15 percent of Canadians approve of the federal government's current carbon tax scheme, and we know that includes all nine members of the Ontario Liberal Caucus, Mr. Speaker. And the worst part about this tax is it's only going to get worse, Mr. Speaker. It's going to go up again next April. Now, the worst part about this whole thing is that the environmental commissioner federally has said that it's not even having an impact. It's not reducing emissions, Mr. Speaker. But what we're doing in Ontario is, Mr. Speaker, we're investing in nuclear. We have the largest procurement for battery storage out in the field right now. And just this morning, we were announcing hydrogen innovation fund investments Spons. at our natural gas facilities at Atura Power. We're going to be driving down emissions. We have one of the cleanest grids in the world, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to make sure that it stays that way. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Like the minister, I agree that it is time for the federal government to treat Ontario fairly. Their stubborn refusal to budge on any further changes to the disastrous carbon tax after creating an exemption for certain provinces is disheartening. As the minister mentioned, this tax is only going up and up and up, with the next increase scheduled for April 1, only a few short months from now. It's a terrible April Fool's joke, Mr. Speaker. This will make life more difficult for the many Ontarians who are already struggling. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the federal fall economic statement will affect affordability for all Ontarians? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Speaker, the carbon tax is no joke. It's no laughing matter. It's driving people into energy poverty from coast to coast to coast. That's why it's so disheartening that the federal government, when they had the opportunity to remove the carbon tax from home heating fuel, only did it for one small part of our country in Atlantic Canada. We know the type of waste that comes from a Liberal government. Unfortunately, there wasn't much to address the affordability crisis in the federal government's fall economic statement. We know the damage 
of 15 years of Ontario Liberals governing our province, Mr. Speaker. But what's worse is that the current crop of Liberals that are over here are still championing this terrible carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, trying to convince people that Ontarians are better off with a carbon tax than they were previous to the carbon tax coming into effect. I just can't believe that this crop of Liberals in Ontario, as small a crop as they are, they're like a backyard garden, Mr. Speaker. They the next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Speaker, this week the long-awaited inquest began into the tragic death of Solomon Rakiri in C Central East Correctional Centre in Lindsay. A report from Ontario's chief forensic psychiatrist and subsequent OPP Order. investigation found that while in custody, Mr. Rakiri was beaten, pepper sprayed twice, and restrained face down, all leading to his death. Yet after three police investigations, one by the Kawartha Lakes Police Service and two by the OPP, no charges were laid. The coroner's inquest has already revealed more disturbing information about Mr. Fakiri's death, including a graphic 24-minute video of his last moments. To the Premier, will you support the reinvestigation of Mr. Fakiri's death in light of the overwhelming evidence and commit to finally giving his family the justice and closure that they deserve? Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague across for the question. Any death is too many, Mr. Speaker. Any death is a tragedy. And as my friend knows opposite, we do not speak to an ongoing inquest. It would be completely inappropriate. She also knows, Mr. Speaker, that the purpose of an inquest is to determine the circumstances surrounding a death and, if appropriate, make recommendations that may prevent further deaths. Our government continuously works to make sure policies and corrections are in line with best practices. Again, Mr. Speaker, this is a complex issue, and we cannot speak to an ongoing inquest. Speaker, Mr. Fakiri's death demonstrates how harmful it is when mental illness is criminalized in our justice system. Mr. Fakiri was held in solitary confinement while waiting to be assessed for mental health treatment. His family wants answers about why Mr. Fakiri was not transferred to a hospital earlier, why they weren't able to visit him, and what may he have experienced during his 11 days in custody. Ontarians deserve systemic change in our justice system. Speaker. And people in mental health crisis deserve help, not violence. Aside from Mr. Fakiri's family, racialized Black, Indigenous communities across the province are closely monitoring the recommendation coming out of the coroner's inquest. To the Premier, what will this government do to take steps to address the deadly mix of systemic discrimination and mental health stigma in the justice and correctional systems? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. As I said before, as it relates to the inquest, we cannot comment, it, comment on it. It would be inappropriate. But, Mr. Speaker, we are taking steps to ensure that deaths in custody do not occur. Work is underway to approve corrections in Ontario, including historic investments in infrastructure and hiring over 1,500 new people. We've invested in facilities that meet the cultural needs of Indigenous inmates as an example, such as smudging spaces and sweat lodges and teaching lodges. Mr. Speaker, I've seen for myself as I've toured our correctional complexes, I have met with the native inmate liaison officers, the Nilos. I've met with the chaplains. Mr. Speaker, I stay close in contact with the OPSIO union representatives as well. And in the end of the day, in the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, our government is taking this matter seriously, and we will reduce where possible and eliminate inmate experiences in segregation conditions. The next question, the member for Whitby. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. Small businesses are the backbone of Ontario's economy and important job creators in our communities. But sadly, many are often operating on tight margins. Speaker, not only is the carbon tax creating greater hardship for many small businesses, but many are feeling additional 
financial pressure with the upcoming deadline for federal loan repayments. Unfortunately, the independent Liberals seem content to stand by as the federal government punishes businesses with more costs. Instead of standing up for Ontario's entrepreneurs who are struggling because of the regressive carbon tax, they once again voted no to any measure that calls for its repeal. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please share Question. more information about how the carbon tax is negatively impacting Ontario's small businesses? The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Whitby for the question. Speaker, I've had the privilege of hearing directly from entrepreneurs across the province. Time and time again, they express real concern about the burden of rising costs from the federal carbon tax combined with the upcoming deadlines of the CBA loan repayments. The carbon tax inflates expenses at every single step of the supply chain. Whether they're farmers producing food, manufacturers levering our skilled workforce or shops anchoring our main streets. Ontario's job creators all agree this punitive tax hits hardest just as they're getting themselves back on their feet. Many business owners have shared fears it could force them to reduce staff, raise prices or shut their doors for good. Unlike the Liberals and NDP, our government is listening to entrepreneurs Response. and taking action on affordability. If the opposition truly cared about the businesses in their writings, they'd join us in calling on Ottawa to scrap the tax. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for her response. While our government is working tirelessly to support small businesses and entrepreneurs, it's concerning that not all parties are willing to address the real financial pressures that Ontarians face. Time and again, our government has brought forward reasonable solutions to relieve the financial pressure of policies like the federal carbon tax. But instead of meaningful collaboration, the independent Liberals and opposition NDP continue to stand by as Ottawa punishes small businesses in the communities they claim to represent. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is supporting small businesses across our great province? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the member for the question. Speaker, I am proud to be part of a government that, under this Premier's strong leadership, has spoken out against this job-killing tax from the start. I'm glad to see Premiers across all political stripes join us in calling on the federal government to expand exemptions for the carbon tax to lessen the burden on consumers and job creators. Every day I meet inspirational entrepreneurs who are pouring their hearts and souls into building something from nothing, providing jobs and providing hope. That's why we've been there for them with our investment in Futurepreneur, which helps young entrepreneurs access financing, mentorship and resources to turn their bold ideas into thriving businesses. The opposition are concerned about keeping people off the job, but it's this government that works hard to keep the great people of this province on the job. Speaker, we've stepped up to the plate for small business. It's high time the opposition did the same. The next question, the member for Ottawa, West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. While this government sits on a multi-billion dollar slush fund, refusing to help people yep. struggling with the cost of living, food bank use has hit record levels in Ottawa. One in seven Ottawa residents is currently food insecure. In 2023 alone, there have been nearly half a million food bank visits in Ottawa. A growing number of food bank users are employed full time and still can't put food on the table. When is the Premier going to get serious about solving the affordability crisis by reinstating real rent control, increasing social assistance and raising the minimum wage? Mr. of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Now, I appreciate the opportunity, Speaker, to stand up in this House today to reflect on the amazing work that our commodity organizations across this province are doing in support of food banks. You know, just this week alone, we had both Ontario Pork as well as our Chicken Farmers of Ontario 
in this House, and we need to celebrate what they're doing. And I hope the member took time to actually meet face to face with real farmers, because if she had, perhaps she would have learned that the pork farmers of Ontario donate to food banks every year. And chicken farmers of Ontario have donated the equivalent of 8 million meals. Our farmers across this province are doing amazing work to support food banks. But I have to share with you, you know what? We have a strategy in Ontario supported by our government. It's called Grow Ontario. And we're increasing Bonds. our food production and processing in this province by 30% by 2032. Mm -hmm. And we do not have a food security issue in this province, but we have a supplementary question. Perhaps the minister did not hear me, but hunger in Ottawa has doubled under this government. You shouldn't be forcing farmers to give food to people for free. You should be empowering people to actually be able to afford to buy food from farmers. Order. While Ottawa food banks are extending hours into evenings and weekends to accommodate people who have full-time jobs and can't go at any other time, this government is eroding the social safety net at every Order. turn. We know what the solutions are, and the Premier could implement them today if he wanted to. Put a stop to price gouging. Reinstate real rent control. Right increase Ontario Works and ODSP. Yeah. Raise the minimum wage. Why is the Premier busy pretending to be helpless instead of doing his job and helping people? The Premier can reply. Well, I just, I just want to inform the member. First of all, thank you for the question. I don't know if you've read the stats on, on ag production and, and what we're shipping out and exporting, exporting to around the world. We've exported, just on ag products, over $20 billion. If you want to add in food, beverage and ag, we're over $52 billion that we ship out of this province. They've never had a better crop ever than last year. We're going to continue supporting our farmers, supporting the workers that are working there. We have a massive industry. It actually goes right down to 6% of our, our GDP. Yeah. It's just ag products alone. Yeah. That equals about $42 billion overall. So anytime you want to come by my office, I'll inform you of, of what we're doing in the agriculture, food, and beverage sector. Yeah. Next question. The member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. We've spent much of this week talking about how the carbon tax is raising the cost of everything. That is why our government must continue to work diligently to find practical solutions to make Ontario's electricity grid more affordable, cleaner, and more reliable. For example, the minister has previously explained that installing a hybrid heat pump could save families $280 a year while also cutting their home heating emissions by a third. Speaker, can the minister please share information about the cost-saving energy initiatives that our government has already put in place? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, unlike the previous Liberal government, which drove up the cost of electricity every single year, they drove up taxes across our province, Mr. Speaker. Unlike the NDP that wanted the highest carbon tax in the world, Mr. Speaker, and we know exactly what impact it's having because you've heard from ministers right across the government this morning on the impact that it's having on policing, the impact that it's having on farming and agriculture, the impact that it's having on forestry and on rural school busing. Mr. Speaker, what we can do is work together as an Ontario legislature, and I would ask all members to do this. Now, I know the Liberals from Ontario don't want to do this. The NDP have shown a little bit of inclination to maybe want to do the right thing here. Bonds. But let's come together, Mr. Speaker. Let's call Jagmeet and let's call Justin. And let's make sure they do the right thing and take the carbon tax off home heating for Ontarians like they did for a Concludes our question period for this morning.